Shannon Watkins. I'm here with Professor George Lanou. Uh, George Lanou is Research Professor in Public Policy and Political Science at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author of the book Silent Stages, The Loss of Academic Freedom and Campus Policy Debates. Uh, George, thank you very much for taking time to speak with me today. Good afternoon. All right, so let's uh, let's first just talk about uh, 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 the central theme of your book, Silent Stages. Uh, you talk a lot about the need of uh, fair and balanced debate in higher education. Uh, so could you talk about why why is it so important that students be exposed to uh, a broad range of ideas in the form of debate? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, first, I think uh, contemporary public policy problems are quite complex. When you try to sort out how uh, healthcare should be financed, how education should be financed, what immigration policy should look like, um, there, there really are many different points of view on this. The factual basis uh, is hard to understand. If a student takes a particular course in that, those subjects, then the student might get exposed to different points of view. But very few students would take a course on a specific subject like that. And so you need to have occasions that are open to the whole campus where students can hear uh, different points of view on the issues on which they're going to cast a vote. The second thing is we're in a bad period. And public policy debates. Uh, Americans are quite polarized in their views. We're talking past each other. We are adopting to a, a culture in which uh, you do not raise these issues, uh, even with your friends. And what passes for uh, uh, debates, political debates right now, um, these are not real debates. These are candidate auditions in which if a candidate is criticized, the candidate, he or she has 45 seconds to respond. That's not a real debate. That doesn't look like the kind of exchange that we need to have uh, in a democratic society. So I think debates are extremely important. Now, lectures are important too, but by the student time a student is a, a junior in college, a student will have heard, what, 200 lectures? Mm -hmm. In a lecture, if the lecture is an invited lecture to a campus, that lecture is a guest of the campus, uh, probably paid an honorarium, travel expenses, student comes in and hears the lecture. The lecturer knows the database that he or she is using very well. Student is reluctant to, to raise a question about that, even if the student has a good question and if you try to do follow-ups your peers might say well wait a minute you know so a debate the, if you invite the right people then they will know uh, the assets and liabilities of the arguments on both sides they will raise the questions they will say are you going to pay for it what are the unintended consequences can this actually be implemented or or passed in congress all of the things that we really need to consider when we consider public policy, debaters, or sometimes uh, they're not just two sides, they're multiple sides. So a forum with uh, multiple perspectives is better. Mm -hmm. But that's why I emphasize debates. Great. Uh, so I want to go into uh, a specific study that was conducted by three UNC Chapel Hill professors. It's just right. one of many findings uh, that they found. But at UNC Chapel Hill here in North Carolina, uh, they found that about 25% of students on campus were in favor of shutting down uh, uh, events where views that they disagreed with were uh, being expressed. Uh, and that's, you know, not a small minority. That's, that's somewhat, uh, that's definitely significant. Uh, nevertheless, the campus doesn't, on a year-to-year -year basis, doesn't really experience many violent shutdowns. Uh, but I want you to speak to this point that even though uh, campuses might not have a dramatic uh, shutdown like at Middlebury with Charles Murray, is that really 
does that really demonstrate the school being open to a diversity of ideas? Is there something else that we should look at? Well, that's a good question. Uh, one of the ways not to avoid a speech disinvitation or disruption is never to invite the speaker in the first place. And I think now administrators are aware of the fact that there would be some um, substantial uh, group on the campus that would create a public relations problem for the campus. So if you're thinking about inviting a speaker on any of the controversial issues, uh, uh, abortion policy, uh, immigration policy, uh, anything in which people really feel very passionate about it, you're inclined to say, maybe not, you know, let, let, let's not go there. Uh, let, let, let's, let's not run the risk. So I argue that that a sign of academic freedom and of, of intellectual health is not silence. It's not that there have been no disruptions. It is when there's actual engagement and students and faculty have learned that you should listen respectfully uh, to people that you think you disagree with. That's healthy. Silence is in an academic setting is not a healthy uh, indication. Well, no, that's a that's a very important point, I think. And so that that's a good segue into uh, uh, a deeper discussion of the book and research you conducted. Uh, this is your book, so viewers can see silence stages. Uh, could you could you tell us about the research uh, that you outline in the book and and what motivated it? Okay, let me start with motivation first. Sure. Um, I've taught. Uh, constitutional law, civil rights, civil liberties uh, for almost four decades. And those are inherently controversial subjects. Even our finest legal minds may be split five to four on, on, on the great questions. That's, that's wonderful. You expose students to, to, to different points of view. And in all the years of teaching, um, I never got a feedback of, well, of course, made me feel unsafe or, or somebody said something that was a microaggression or that you shouldn't have assigned anything on this particular subject. Just wasn't, did never come up. Now we see these kinds of, of uh, protests coming from students that create very serious problems in, in what's taught and professors revising their curriculums, avoiding certain kinds of things because they don't want to get that kind of a feedback or create that kind of a problem. And so I began to wonder whether uh, I was feeling uh, these kinds of pressures or reading about them in some isolation. But then uh, four years ago, I was invited to a national conference sponsored by the Institute for Humane Studies with professors from all over the country, some from uh, very visible institutions, some from, from less well-known institutions, different ranks. And there was a consensus that, that there was a kind of fog setting in in higher education, a kind of a, of a feeling that subjects that, that had been raised for decades in, in higher education, now maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe, maybe if you did it, the consequences would be greater than the worth of, of having a discussion about these things. So I thought, well, uh, it isn't just a, a, a feeling that I'm having. There must be something going on, and I wanted to study it. And I thought the, the way to study it empirically was to do research on what actually gets debated uh, and who the participants' topics are and, or forums with diverse points of view. So we created a, uh, a national sample, stratified sample, um, 97 campuses, uh, some of the very top uh, campuses in the country to, to some uh, lesser known campuses and 28 law schools, uh, enrolling almost a million students. And we looked at campus calendars to see what uh, was debated or what forums there were. And then we had to go back uh, oftentimes to uh, try to identify what was actually going on, particularly in the forums. Mm -hmm. Debate clear. They're labeled as clear and the debate structure is pretty obvious, but you can have a forum, which is really an advocacy group where you get four people who are on the same side or are friends of who invited them. And, and there's no real uh, diverse uh, view. So you have to go back and check all that out. The bottom line was this, with some exceptions, 
uh, very wealthy institutions, which have a lot of research uh, institutes, which do sch schedule forums, um, and some law schools. Uh, there are very few uh, policy debates on campus that we could identify or forums. In fact, uh, it's less than one per thousand students, considerably less than one per thousand students. We looked at 24 different policy issues, uh, including an other category, which would capture everything. Mm -hmm. And we found that on, uh, for example, take immigration. A study was done in 2014, 2015 calendar years. By 2016, it was clear immigration was a big issue. It was one of the maybe top three issues in the presidential campaign. On campuses, over these two year periods, 97 campuses, 20, 28 law schools, we found exactly three immigration policy debates. Well, there's something wrong there. Students need to have access to what is going on in the rest of the country, where it was obviously a very contentious issue. They need to hear about it. They need to be able to hear people who are well-informed, treat each other civilly, and be able to ask questions. That's a very important thing. The debate should always uh, involve students in asking questions. So that that led up to the uh, the research and then eventually the publication of the book. Wow. Well, thank you for all that. You answered a lot of my questions, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, why do you think colleges, why do you think there are, there are so few policy debates on college campuses? <laughs> Well, I can, I can tell you what we found in the book, but since the, then I've had a, a number of conversations with administrators, and I, I, think, I think maybe the answer in the book is, is more theoretical than it needed to be. But I'll tell you what the theory is first. Uh, campuses have become uh, much more corporate in their structure and in their view of branding. Controversy is not good for branding. Corporations don't like controversy. No corporation sponsors internal debates for its employees in any public way. And so a campus administrator who is examining whether to do anything that might create uh, controversy among students, among potential funders, uh, you know, why go there? <laughs> that's, that's quiet as quiet as good. The second thing is the growth of uh, student affairs administrators, which has been very substantial in, in the country. And, and for many of them, they not only are politically very ho homogeneous, there's, there's Samuel Abrams has done research on that, but their view is my job is to keep the campus uh, fun, comfortable, and safe. Mm. And political debates don't, <laughs> don't enter into that. A third thing is that uh, faculty uh, are rewarded uh, for research and often for teaching uh, and for going out and doing the work to sponsor a public policy debate is just not part of their incentive systems. Mm -hmm. Fourthly, in the politically relevant departments, we have increasingly a, a, a partisan monoculture. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of research about that so that um, there are not different points of view uh, articulated within the department. And you, if you're in a department with a monoculture, you may not realize or perhaps respect the idea that there are different points of view than those that are held within the department. So those four things I think are, are structural problems. Mm -hmm. But in my conversations with campus administrators, um, I discovered that maybe the, there's a simpler answer. Hmm. Uh, I had the discussion with uh, top administrator at, uh, administrators at the uh, University of Colorado campus. They're very supportive of campus debates. They thought it was a great idea. They ought, ought to do that. It's good for citizenship, good for, for learning. It's good for critical thinking. So they said to me, why don't you think we have them on our campus? And I thought that was a little kind of a strange question because they ought to know that. Uh, they're the ones to diagnose that. Um, but the, the simple uh, explanation um, that I advanced and they agreed with is there was no locus of responsibility and no budget. And when you don't 
do those things when you don't say somebody's responsible for arranging this and here's the money to get it done doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. You think of all of the other activities on campus, whether they're cultural activities, music, uh, theater, athletics. Um, I mean, I, I, how could you have an athletic team without a budget and a coach and somebody to arrange travel, et cetera? Uh, so if you if you don't do that, if, if it doesn't rise to the priority of the institution, so you assign somebody, uh, this is your responsibility to get this done. And you don't create a budget, it won't happen. And I was very pleased to see in the North Carolina report that they said uh, they, they wanted to assign this responsibility to the provost and in many institutions that may be the right place. Other institutions, it might be a faculty student committee. Uh, but they said that somebody needs to take responsibility for this and, and there needs to be a budget. And I've been thinking how simple this could be. Mm -hmm. The simplest way to do it was, would say, look, let's take what is for most universities a trivial sum, $12,000, and give $1,000 to each professor who submits a proposal for a public policy debate. And somebody has to say, well, we can't have six debates on healthcare policy. We need to spread this out. And somebody might need to say, well, I don't think that's very balanced. You don't really represent the different points of view. $12,000 and a minimum screening, you get 12 policy debates. That would maybe would be more than we found on any campus in the United States. So I don't, I don't think this is a, a yeah, there are some 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 deep structural problems, but I think they're pretty simple solutions too. What do you think is a good way to hold colleges accountable for uh, for hosting these debates? Well, um, I think I think campuses are accountable for many things now, a huge huge number of things. The federal government, state governments, trustees. Um, alumni groups occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the 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 responsibility, the 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 machinery for turning the engine to get to get campus to say, you know, we have a responsibility here. We're we're not doing this because right. sometimes they've never actually thought about it. Uh, first, I think it's best if it comes from trustees or regents, depending on your state governance structure. Mm -hmm. They pretty much need to say um, to the president, um, what, are we, what are we doing here? And the president in most cases will say, I'll get back to you on that. And the president will go talk to the provost and the provost will say, I need to talk to the deans. Because if you ask the president, what was the record of your basketball team or your football team last year? Bam, knows that right away. If you ask him what kinds of policy debates or forums with diverse points of view, there's no report on that. Never thought about it. So, so there needs to be a process where uh, campuses are accountable, will record what goes on, and then if they have to record what goes on, then they'll think of incentives and structures to get it done. And if trustees and regents won't do it, then I think state legislators have to ask the question of the public institutions. Uh, and I think it won't take very long, maybe a two-year cycle, when the question gets asked and administrators realize they're going to have to report this and they don't want to report zero and they don't want to be in a position where, uh, let's say in Indiana, that Purdue is really has a wonderful record and Indiana University doesn't, uh -huh. uh, then, then you get a situation where the president of Indiana says, we can't look this bad, let's get this done. And I repeat again, it isn't really a matter of money. It's a matter of priorities and focus. Mm -hmm. What can uh, local think tanks in states uh, like the Martin Center, uh, what can local organizations do to help uh, if, if colleges aren't doing a good job of telling students what sort of opportunities that already exist on campus, but you know, it's mm -hmm. hard to find out. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what, what can other outsourced organizations do to help? Well, you've already done some really good things. Uh, you've publicized uh, uh, the, uh, you have a report on, on North Carolina uh, doing away with uh, uh, 
restrictions on free speech and and you've noted some progress in, in that regard and i think i think get doing away with the restrictions on free speech is a very good thing and 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 the martin center's done a good job in publicizing it um but eliminating restrictions on free speech doesn't necessarily mean it'll happen uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that the result won't just be silence so i think um uh, Organizations like the Martin Center and some of your uh, uh, peer organizations in other states uh, can play an important role in publicizing what actually happens in public policy debates. And uh, it's my hope that I'm going to be able to do research in, in North Carolina and, and also in a Midwestern state. Uh, so you will have facts. Uh, it, it's important not to just generalize. It's important not to just condemn higher education. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is identify exemplary institutions, and then the laggards will probably say, um, well, we look kind of bad. We, we need to do something. But that should be done very factually. It, should, it shouldn't just be a, a, a generalization. It should be a campus-by-campus -campus survey, mm -hmm. and it's my hope to be able to do that. Uh, now that you mentioned North Carolina, uh, uh, were any North Carolina colleges uh, part of your research that you looked at uh, for campus debates? Yes, there, there were probably three or four out of the 97. Okay. okay. Um, and I have one final question uh, related to our solutions discussion. Uh, sure. What can parents and students do when they're looking uh, to decide what college to go to, how what can what what can they do uh, to make sure that they send their their children to a college where they will encounter different ideas? Well, that's a good question, and, and I, I address that in the in the end of the book because um, hopefully this is not going to be a top down uh, situation that parents and families uh, can influence this process in a, in a good way. And there's several kinds of issues. Um, as, as you know, looking at the admissions process, usually students say, will visit a campus, they'll walk around, they'll see the buildings, they'll see uh, slideshows, they'll see different kinds of things. A simple question, uh, what kinds of public policy debates or forums with diverse points of view um, does your campus sponsor? Well, the student walking backwards on the campus tour won't know. But if the question comes up over and over again, then admissions is going to say, uh, we're getting this question. We can, we can easily answer uh, how many books are in the library, what percentage of which ethnic groups are on the campus, what kinds of food options are available. We don't know what to tell them about public policy debates and forums. So that kind of question then can also stimulate um, some organized activity to get this done and, and to create a record of it. But there's another issue as well. If you have a campus where there's really a monoculture in many of the politically relevant campuses, uh, politically relevant departments, mm -hmm. then a family has a reasonable concern about whether their son or daughter uh, would be treated fairly in internships, in recommendations, would get a, a broad education about the various policy options that exist. So I think it's, it's reasonable to ask. Uh, my son or daughter wants to study economics, political science, sociology, anthropology. Um, are there professors with different points of view? Mm -hmm. and, and again, Typically, the campus won't know, but if it gets the question often enough, then it'll say, yeah, maybe we ought to find out. Mm -hmm. um, and just as you wouldn't want to go to a campus where you thought that if you wanted to do an internship with um, a particular kind of organization, um, reputable organization, but the faculty would say, well, you know, we don't want to write a recommendation for that or, or mm -hmm. even worse if the faculty would be reluctant to write a recommendation to graduate school because they thought your political points of view were not theirs mm -hmm. uh, that's a serious problem and i think families ought to inquire about that absolutely well uh 
I, I, I think that you've empowered parents, students, and uh, everyone interested in the future of higher education uh, with some important knowledge uh, and the research you conducted. So I uh, really appreciate uh, your work and, uh, and thank you uh, for taking the time to speak with me today. Well, thank you. And we're not finished yet. Uh, we're going to be looking at state studies. Great. And I think states are the place where change can happen. Absolutely. That the, the states have the, the levers through legislators or trustees or regents to get change to happen. So that's the goal. Wonderful. Uh, well, George, thank you uh, so much for speaking with me today. I will definitely stay in touch and keep an eye out for all your future research. Thanks for the Martin Center. You're doing a great job. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.